Anyway, so last week, um, Graham gave us a statement that hopefully that you, whenever you went to work or school and you saw that messy person before you criticized him, before you judged him, before you, you know, got upset with him, that you, uh, remember the phrase, you remembered that phrase? It was, um, I know a mess when I see one because I am one. Remember that one? In fact, why don't we just repeat that now? Because I think it's worth us remembering, but not just repeat it. I want you to look at the person next to you and point to them and say, I know a mess when I see one. Go ahead. And then, because I am one. Now, the person who did that to you, you better do it back to them. I know a mess when I see one, because I am one, right? The reason why this is so much, I mean, does that make you feel better too? Makes me feel a lot better, right? Especially when I can compare myself to someone else. If you pick the right person, you should feel really good about yourself. Uh, that should make you feel better, but the reason why I, wanna, uh, I, want, I want us to remember this, uh, and it's so important, is because when we acknowledge our messes, we are just a baby step away from acknowledging God. Think about this. When we are honest enough with ourselves to acknowledge our messes, we are just this far away from acknowledging who God is. And then, because when we acknowledge our messes, we are acknowledging that there is something outside of us to which we are, are accountable that we fall short of. Uh, Graham used this statement from the Apostle Paul last week, and it goes like this. He says, for all have sinned and fallen short of God, right? Because everyone's done that. Everyone has a mess. And in fact, the mess is what we have in common. The mess is what brings us together because all of us at some point or another, sometime or another in life, all of us have had a mess in our life, right? All of us have been a mess. And so when we acknowledge that we are a mess, we are just a baby step away from acknowledging who God is. Now, so I, I got a drop in my mouth. So I know some of your stories. And let me just tell you, some of you guys are a mess, all right? And so what I thought I would do is I thought I would share a couple stories this week and next week about some of my messes. Now, what I wanted to do was talk about the messes that I made when I was a teenager or a young adult. That, that's just too easy though, isn't it? I mean, you're dumb when you're in your 20s. Isn't it funny how you think you're so, I'm an adult now, I'm so smart, and you look back and go, boy, I was dumb, right? So uh, that would be too easy. So the mess I wanna share today happened 15 years ago. And this is why this is significant. Not only was I a Christ follower, I was the pastor of this church. So that will be huge when I tell you this mess. Now, before I kind of set this mess up, just let me tell you that I'm the kind of guy, I grew up where you took matters into your own hand, you didn't wait for the law, you didn't use lawyers, you just did. Like, I, when we first got married, I bought us a new, <laughs> we first got married, I had a Vespa with a sidecar. And Darlene got pregnant, and she said, I'm not coming home from the hospital in that sidecar. And I was like, we can put a baby seat in there. She's like, I'm not gonna do it. So we bought a truck, it was a new truck, and then about two months after I got the truck, insurance, this is before email, writes me a letter and says, oh, we have to raise your rates because we underestimated the value of the truck. I'm like, that's, that's bull, man. This truck is, you know, it was brand new when I bought it. So there's a manufacturer, re, you know, MSRP or whatever. So they, I said, I'm not renewing them. I'll look for someone else. Well, I didn't. I looked for some new insurance. I never did look for it when it came time to renew. Now, this is back before the internet and, you know, they didn't suspend your license if you didn't have insurance back then. But I couldn't get my tag renewed. So I was, a kind, you know, 23 years old. So I'd take a razor blade and I'd peel your little yellow sticker off your tag and I'd put it on mine. And I was been driving around for a couple of years with an unregistered car. That's the, kind of, that's the kind of person I was. But now I'm a Christ follower. I'm a pastor. We move here. We start this church and we have a house uh, on the water and I have a, some extra boat slips. And so I rent a boat slip out to a gentleman that was actually from out of state and he wants to, he's trying to do a parasail business. So his boat is in my slip, but it also has a very small, sl slow leak in it. So it's always pumping water. The bilge pump's always running, but he also has oil in the bilge. And so when he's pumping the water over, when it pumps the water over automatically, there's getting a, a sheen around my dock, you know, and it looks like you can be fined for that. You know, people can be fined for that. And he's slow. I, it's hard to get the rent out of him. And so I, you know, I charge him this much money. I can't get him to pay the rent. Anyway, season moves into the fall and he's not running anymore, the boat's still there, and he hasn't paid his rent three or four months. I'm trying to find, trying to find the guy, I go over to his house, it's, he's moved out, he won't answer his phone, but every, uh, and the pump is, the pump that's on his boat, it runs the battery dead, so the boat's starting to sit lower and lower and lower in the water. 
And every once in a while, an, an employee would show up and they would have a rental pump from a rental company and they'd pump the water out. And I'd tell them, look, just tell your boss, I don't care about the money, okay? Just get the boat out of here. And I, I couldn't get them to respond. I couldn't get them to the boat out. In fact, one time I had to go rent the pump to keep the boat from sinking in my own boat slip. Now, again, going back to the law, it, it takes a long time to evict somebody out of a house and even out of a boat slip. It takes almost six months. You have to do these legal notices, put it in the paper. Well, I'm not having that. And we're, it's now winter time, and I haven't had rent from him in six months. I don't even care about the rent. I just want the boat out, and he, uh, I can't get a hold of him. So, one cold winter night at about 2 a.m., me and one of my best friends, I'm not going to say who it is, but he works here. Um, <laughs> We got up at 2 a.m. and we towed this boat in the middle of the night over to Noriega Point. We pushed it up onto the point and we put the anchor out so it wouldn't drift away. Well, what, I didn't know this would happen, but so as that boat is slowly leaking because it's up on the, uh, on the incline like this, the stern starts filling up with water and even with the anchor on, uh, even with the anchor out, it starts sliding down into the deeper water. And by the weekend, there's nothing but the bow sticking out of the water. And the that Saturday, the Destin Log decided to do an article about all the derelict boats in the harbor, and they put this boat's picture on the cover of the newspaper. In fact, I was sitting at Brotula's, and one of my friends, who's a captain, they go, did you see this? And I was like, <laughs> and that's the boat that we had towed. <laughs> well, that set into motion a whole bunch of legal issues where I had to get an attorney, and uh, you know, they wanted me to take a lie detector test and all that kind of stuff. Now, um, it's kind of funny when we tell the story 15 years after, especially because statute of limitations has gone by so they can't do anything. <laughs> but, but you know what? At the moment, it wasn't very funny. At the moment, I was like, why did I do this? Why, where, and how do I get out of this mess? Where do I even start? You know, last week, if you were here last week, uh, I was supposed to be here, but I actually got sick and ended up throwing up for 30 hours, ended up in the hospital getting IVs. That's why my voice is so hoarse. So I was supposed to be here. And by the way, Darlene is actually, my wife is in Tampa at Hope Church. She's down there consulting with them. She says hello, and she's probably gonna see this online. And she's the greatest woman that has ever lived. And, um, <laughs> but so last week, we, you, if you were here, you heard the story, the, the, the mess that I'm in right now. And it, when you're in the mess, it's not easy to laugh at it. And maybe one day I'll be able to laugh at this mess I'm in right now, but I don't see it. You know, and this mess that 15 years ago, it changed my life because I had to move from that one point where I can't take care of things myself this way. I have to use them because I'm a pastor of a church and it changed my behavior forever. I don't do those kind of things anymore. I try to work through the proper processes. I understand that I'm a pastor. I understand that I have a reputation in the community. But, and I was so embarrassed and I was so ashamed that I would have never talked about it then. So here's who I want to talk to today. I want to talk to that group of you that maybe you're in a mess right now. Maybe you are in a place where you're a mess and you, you don't know how you're going to get out of it. You know, you don't know what you're going to do next. You, you, you've made a mess of something that's so big, that's so deep and so outrageous. It might be your finances. It might be your family. It might be your job. It could be your academic life. Maybe you made a mess at college your first year. You, you didn't take it seriously and now you flunked out and you've lost your scholarships. Maybe it's your professional life. Maybe it's something going on in your marriage. Maybe it's something wrong with your parents your, or your children. Or maybe you've gotten trouble with the law. I don't, I don't know what it is, but right now it would be so big that you'd say, this mess is so big and it's so deep. I'm not sure I can fix this. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how to get out of this mess. And this is a mess that if you're real honest, it's probably your fault. You know, you ignored somebody's advice or you ignored your conscience or, you, you know, you ignored, you knew it was the right thing to do and you didn't do it anyway. You ignored your parents or your best friend or someone who loves you who was just trying to be honest with you and, and, and you ignored it. That's the group of people that I want to talk to today. You got a messy part of your life right now and you're wondering, I don't know what to do. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. Now, Graham said something last week but I rephrased it because I think I said it, I'm saying it better than he did. And that's this. 
Um, he said this, the mess that brings, well, no, when we acknowledge, did we do this one? No, the mess that brings us together is the mess that brought God near. See, what we all have in common, and even the whole world common, has in common, we, the, the mess that brings us together, the mess that we all have in common, is the very thing that brought God to the world in the first place. But what we're going to discover today, and what I hope some of you will walk away with this morning, is simply this, is not only is the mess that, that we're in brought God near, the mess that you're in right now has the potential to bring God near to you in a way that you've never discovered God before. The mess that you're in right now has the most potential for your, a new relationship to introduce yourself to a God who loves you. Now, the, there's a very famous verse in the New Testament, John chapter 3, verse 16, and it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. In other words, God so loved the world that he waded into the mess. He moved into the mess. The Bible says that he, that he moved in among us and camped with, with, with humanity, right? But what we're going to discover is even better than that. Because the verse after John 3, 16, I don't know if you don't have to be a Bible scholar to know, it's verse 17, right? Graham talked about this, this last week. And the thing about this verse is it doesn't get a lot of airplay. You don't see Tim Tebow wearing it on his face, right? You don't see people holding up signs at ball games that says John 3, 17. But I think this verse is so important because Graham talked about it last week that we need to look at it again. We need to hear it again because we'll, we will discover that that mess that you wish that you could go back and undo, that mess that you wish that you could turn back the hands of time and if you could make a decision because if you're honest with yourself, you know that it's your fault, that mess that you created that you're wondering, how am I ever gonna get out of this? How am I ever gonna fix this? The very mess, that very mess that might be your fault or could be your fault is the very thing that God uses to introduce himself to you in a way that would never before be possible. Here's, here's what he says in John 3, 17. In John 3, 17, it says, For God did not send his son into the, the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God, Jesus didn't come into this world to get into the faces of all these messy people and go, Look what you did. Look, look, what, look at the mess that you made of your life. Look at the mess that you made of your relationships, the mess that you made of your finances, the mess that you've made of your reputation. What the, look at the mess that you've made of your future. But God, through Jesus, illustrated, as we're gonna see, that God came in the world to enter the lives of messy people and to rescue them from their mess, which means to rescue us from ourselves. Because let's be honest, isn't it true that we are behind most of the messes that we end up in? Isn't it true that we are part of every mess that we've ever made? And when you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the, the life of Jesus, you see this in the most intimate, the most passionate, the most personal way imaginable. In fact, one day Jesus was teaching, uh, got a big crowd around him, and while he's teaching, the leaders of the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they drag this woman in front of him who'd made a mess of her life. And if you've heard this story before, you know, you might have heard it if you're, you've probably heard it if you've been in church, but maybe you've heard it even if you weren't in church. Anyway, she, she's the, he's there teaching, and they drag this woman who's been accused of adultery. She's messed up her marriage. She's messed up someone else's marriage. I mean, the, everything is a wreck. And after having a conversation with her accusers, you know what Jesus does? He stands up and he looks at this, this woman, this condemned woman, this woman that's made a mess of her life. And he says, look at me. He says, I do not, and here's our word, I do not condemn you. In other words, I'm not going to sentence you to what they say you deserve. I'm not going to sentence you to what the, the law says you deserve. And then he says, look, he says, look at me. So leave your life of sin. Another time, Jesus is walking along with a crowd of people around him. And as he's walking, he sees a tax collector up in the tree. Probably never seen a tax collector up in a tree. Have you ever seen one? I haven't seen one, right? And so there's a tax collector up in the tree, and his name is Zacchaeus, and probably at the bottom of the tree, he's got bodyguards because he was despised and hated because the guy had completely fouled up, completely messed up his life. He'd taken a job as a tax collector, but not only that, which made you a traitor because you're collecting taxes for Rome, 
but he had actually enriched himself off the backs of the hardworking people of his community. So he was despised and he's hated. And there's no way out. At that point, when you put yourself in that position, everybody hates me. I'm a mess of my life. What am I going to do? There's nothing else I can do. But he wanted to see Jesus. And so he climbs up into this tree. And as Jesus is walking along, he looks up and sees this mess of a man and says, come down to me. Because today we're going to your house, you little messy man. And they go to Zacchaeus' house and behind closed doors, Jesus looks at this mess of a man and he says, I want you to leave your life of sin and follow me. And the New Testament tells us that Zacchaeus' life is radically changed, drastically changed. In fact, even though nobody liked him, even though he was despised in the community, he went back into the community and began to pay back people not only what he stole from them. The law required that when you stole somebody something from someone and you got it back, not only did you have to pay it back, but you had to pay back a percentage more. He actually paid back with interest more than the law required. Another time, Jesus is walking in an area where Jews uh, don't really go. It was a place called Samaria, and the Jews and the Samaritans did not get along. Racism was at a fevered pitch during this time between these two two groups of people. We're going to talk about more of that next week. And so he's in Samaria, a place where Jews don't normally go, and he stops by a well in the middle of the day when it's just blistering hot. And in the middle of the day when no one should be out there, a woman comes to the well and her life is a mess. That's why she went out at noon instead of early in the morning when it was cool and all the other women went to get water. And the reason why her life is a mess is because she's been married five times, which that's a lot now. It was a whole lot back then. And the man that she's living with now is not even her husband. And so here she is, it's just her and Jesus by the well, and she expected Jesus to say nothing to her because first of all, she's a Samaritan. And Jews don't really talk to Samaritans. And, I mean, because that's game over. And she, she's a woman. So he would never speak. And if, she, if he knew what kind of mess she'd made of her life, there'd be, no, there'd be less reason for him to talk to her because of the kind of woman she was. And you know what Jesus does? He looks at her and says, come to me, come close to me. And I will give you the thirst. I will quench the thirst that you've been trying to quench your entire life. In other words, this love that you've been looking for in all the wrong places, come with me, come follow me, and I will give you that love. Even at the end of his life, even at the end of Jesus' life, hanging on the cross, Graham talked about this last week. He has an interchange with another man who'd made such a mess of his life, so thoroughly and completely messed up his life that he'd been arrested. But even in his rest, he wasn't even trusted to serve a sentence sentence, a service, serve a sentence, sorry. He wasn't even trusted to serve a sentence. The only thing that he could do with his life was serve as an example for others what happens when you cross Rome. And there, hanging on the cross, he'd been condemned to die, and Jesus says to him, you're coming with me. Today, you are going to be with me in paradise. No matter, no matter how messy your life is, maybe you're watching online and there's a reason why you're watching online because you don't wanna, you're afraid to come to a place like this. No matter how messy your life is, how deep the mess is, how much of it is your fault, the fact that you told one lie to get out of this lie and that led to another lie and now you've dug yourself into a hole that's so deep that you don't know what to do. Here's what I have to say to you. Regardless of your mess, regardless of whether it's your fault, Jesus offers you what he offered these messy people. What he offered these messy people, and this is just a little slice of all the people in the gospels that we're talking about. This is just four. He offers you the way out. I mean, and this this is the gospel. This is the message of Jesus. And do you know what he offered all four of these people? He offered himself. He offered himself as the solution to their messes. Now, the gospel writer of John, who is John, (laughs) he wrote and quoted something that Jesus said. And we often quote this at Christmas, but I believe in looking in light of the messes that we get ourselves in, we're gonna see it a different way. It says this in John chapter eight, verse 12. It says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. In other words, 
I can show you a way forward. I can show you the way out of this, 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 uh, this mess that you're in. Again, we kind of think of this as, oh, the light of the world. It's kind of a Christmassy thing, right? But here's what this means for you if you've created a mess. It, what, what this means is if you've created a mess in your life, you're in a dark place. It, it can feel alone. You can feel like the woman who goes out at noon because nobody else wants to be there. I mean, you don't want to be around anyone else because you're so ashamed and you don't know what you're going to do about the mess. You don't know how you're going to get out of it. It's a messy place and you need to know the way out. And as you watch Jesus navigate his way in and out of the lives of these messy people in the New Testament, you can be rest assured of this, that your heavenly father through Jesus has invited you to follow Jesus even though your life is a mess. Because Jesus did not pull back from the messy people of the world. So he says this, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. I want you to think about this, okay? Think about something. And let's be honest. Isn't it true that you were not following Jesus when you made a mess of your life? Isn't it true that you, you said no to your conscience or you ignored wise advice, or you, you, if you grew up in church, you ignored that what you knew was between right and wrong. In fact, you know what? I've talked myself into the worst decisions I've ever made. I have. I, I knew, I've talked myself into the worst decisions that I've ever made, and while I was doing it, I knew it was wrong, and I still did it. And now Jesus says, you know what? If you will follow me, which means since you weren't following him into the mess, It's time you begin to follow someone out of the mess so that if you're going to get out of that mess. Now, you may not have been a Christian. You may not have been like, I didn't even believe in God at the time. doesn't matter. Jesus says, what I want you to do is I want you to follow me. He says, "I'm I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, you... I know what you want when you're in a mess because I want the same thing. I know what you want, okay? When I'm in a mess, you know what I want? I want somebody to fix it. I want AAA to show up. I want to call CETO. I want to get a lawyer to fix it. I want somebody to show up, fix my mess. I shake their hand and go, thanks a lot, man. I'll call you if I ever need you again. But that's not always how it works, especially with God. See, your heavenly father loves you too much to do it that way. And see, his goal for you is not simply to fix your mess and clean things up. It's way bigger. It's way broader than that. He's a heavenly, he is a good and perfect father, right? You know what most fathers want? I mean, good fathers, you know what good fathers want? Good fathers want relationships with their children. And, and with, uh, because a relationship is more important to a father than behavior. Let me say that again. A relationship is more important than behavior. I would rather have imperfect kids who love me than perfect children who don't want anything to do with me. Oh, wait, that's what I have. (laughs) And so do you, right? So I would rather have imperfect children that love me instead of perfect children that don't want anything to do with me. And that thing that's in me as an imperfect earthly father is in the heart of our heavenly father. Yes, your behavior is important, but it's not the most important thing to him. The most important thing to your heavenly father is a personal, intimate relationship with him that comes through the person that made this possible, and that is his son, Jesus Christ. But see, I want to fix. I want somebody to come fix it. I want to make a call. I want somebody to come clean up my mess. I, wanna, I want somebody that'll, that'll shake my hand and say, hey, let me know when you need me again. But your heavenly father says, I want so much more for you than that. I want a relationship. I want you to follow. I want you to follow me. Now the question is, what does that look like? What does it look like to follow Jesus? I mean, we're not, we don't live in Bible times when we follow Jesus around, right, and listen to him teach, right? So what, I mean, we talk about being a Jesus follower here all the time. And re- essentially it means just having a relationship, Right? And if you're going to have a relationship, that means it's a process. But Jesus says, look, I I, I, I see your mess, and I'll wade into the mess with you. But I want more than than just fix the mess. I want you to follow me. So what does that look like? Well, at the very end of, you guys have heard of the Sermon on the Mount? 
Sermon on the Mount is big mess, big, spe- uh, ooh, big speech, a big uh, message that Jesus gives, and he talks about how to live. He talks about how to live with people, how to, uh, you know, the, how, talks about lust and hatred and murder, and you've heard it said this. And at the very end of this long sermon, he gives us an analogy of what it looks like to follow him. It's in, it's in the end of Matthew, Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 26. He says this. But everyone who hears these words of mine look at, and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. So following Jesus begins with this declaration. God, I've built my house on the sand. And right now I'm reaping what I've sown. I've built my academic pursuits. I've built my, my, my profession. I've built my relationships. I've built my finances. I've built this area on my, of my life on something that doesn't last. And it isn't working. In fact, it's starting to crumble down around me. And you know, God, my first inclination is, a, is to, I'm tempted to treat you like AAA or CETO or to come fix my, my situation. But I, the thing that you offer yourself, that's what I really need. So following Jesus is, is actually beginning to just say, God, I've done this. I've built my life like this, and it's not working. And then he goes on to say, here's what else. It's, it also is saying this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, okay? Everyone, so first he says, everyone who builds these, hears these words and doesn't put them into practice, doesn't do what they're learning, he says, it's like building your house on the sand, But every person who decides ahead of time, Jesus, whatever you ask me to do, I'm going to do. I've pre-decided that I'm following you. Whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do. I'm not going to, I'm no longer going to just try to get advice or, you know, try to, try to figure out what I'm going to do or get on forums and, you know, consider things. I'm not just going to do that anymore. Jesus, today, I'm going to surrender my life and I'm going to surrender my decision making and I'm going to give all my decision making abilities to you and whatever you say to do, I'm going to do it. I'm going to say yes. So he says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now, here's the thing that we miss. It's that little word right there, built. Are you going to show that? It's that little word built, right? Building is a process. When you build something, it doesn't happen right away. It's not a quick fix. It's not an overnight fix. I mean, you're adults. You know that. You've seen it happen. The messes that we fall into, the messes that we create in our life, we want a quick fix. But you know what would happen if we just had somebody come fix every mess that, would, that we're in? You know what happened? We'd do the same thing again, right? You've seen it with parents who won't let their kids pay the consequences for the messes that they've been in, and they just do it over and over and over. See, your your heavenly father is a good heavenly father who wants something more than just simply fixing your mess. And Jesus says to you this morning, and you watch it online, I'm going to tell you how to get get out of your mess. And I'm going to tell you that if you will follow the light of the world, if you will begin to build your life upon your areas of your life on my teaching, I will lead you out of your mess. Do you know this is why we offer these deep, deep dive Bible studies, precepts Bible studies. I'm gonna be leading one starting in a couple weeks on the book of Galatians. The reason why we offer these to you is because not only are we gonna teach you how to study God's word, and, which is Jesus' teachings, right? But we're gonna teach you how to put them into practice because it creates a good foundation. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, puts them into practice, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock Here's why this is important. The rain came down. Anybody see that rain yesterday? The rain came down. The streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. So here's the bottom line for today as we begin to wrap up. This is the big idea, if you will. And I'm going to tell you what, some of you are not going to like this, especially if you're in a mess but you need to know this. Here's the, here's the thing I want you to remember. You cannot pray your way out of a mess that you have behaved your way into. You cannot pray your way, you cannot confess your way out of a mess that you've behaved your way into. Now, I'm not disregarding miracles. I believe in God and I believe in miracles, okay? 
but you cannot, pr- there's no silver bullet. There's no quick fix. There's no magic words. And it's not because God doesn't care. In fact, he cares so much that he sent the light. 2,000 years ago, he sent the light of the world that if you had chosen to follow it, you probably wouldn't be and I would be in the mess that I'm in right now because it was most likely avoidable and I did not step and you did not step into that mess by following Jesus. You stepped into it, I stepped into it by following someone else or something else. And your heavenly father wants you to follow his son out. You cannot pray your way out of a mess that you behaved your way into, but you can follow your way out. And God will meet you in the mess. Back in March, I was out west with Matt, Pastor Matt and, and Bradley, and we were in Arizona. We were in Alpine, Arizona, up in the mountains. And we, had, we needed to drive to Oklahoma, so we were kind of working our way that way to Oklahoma. And we needed to get up to I-40, but I found, because we had Jeeps, I found a trail that was about 40 miles. We could take the road all the way to I-40, or we could take, we had a few hours, we're running ahead of schedule. We could take this, this dirt trail all the way for about 40 miles up to I-40 and catch I-40. So we decided to do that. So we're driving down this trail, and it's super muddy. So it's taken a lot longer than we thought because they'd had some rain. I mean, it was mud everywhere. And then while we're driving this trail, there's winter storm advisories now. And we can see these clouds moving in from the west. They're dark and they've got snow. We can see it snowing. <coughs> so we're moving slow and it dawns on us, we're gonna be out here past dark riding these trails, this trail. And just as this storm is hitting, it's starting to snow, we come around a turn and there is a car with a family stuck in the mud in the middle of nowhere. They're 20 miles from the nearest town or the nearest road. And they'd been stuck for four hours. And they have no blankets and a winter storm is hitting. No jackets. They decided on a whatever afternoon it was, I think it was a Sunday afternoon, they're going to take a drive and go find this this lake they heard about. And now it's about to get dark (coughs) and it's about to snow, winter storm. And they're stuck. And we showed up, of course, and we saw them and we pulled them out. And then we had them follow us all the way out to make sure that they got out of that mess. See, that's what God does. He shows up in your mess and he's not offended by you. He doesn't condemn you. He sees your mess as an opportunity to invite you into a relationship with him because of what Jesus did. And that's how Jesus responded to the messes of the world. And the reason why I know this, the reason why I know it's true is because in this room, right here in all of these seats, sitting next to you are men and women who have stories just like this. They, mess, they have stories that go something like this. I messed up. I gave up. I looked up and God showed up. And this isn't just preacher talk. This isn't just like 2,000 years ago talk. This is... This, there's people all in this room that they got to this point one day where they finally could admit and be honest with themselves, God, I messed up. And then they got to this place. Have you ever been to a place where you just give up? You just don't want to try anymore because my life is such a mess. And they got to that place. They go, I just gave up. And when I looked up, God showed up. And that's the story I hear every single day in this church. I hear it at baptisms. I hear it when people tear their rooted story. You hear it from almost every single person that's a high-level volunteer or a leader or a staff person because we're not perfect people that have never screwed up. We are messes that have been made a mess and we've been redeemed our, by, from our mess, but it wasn't overnight with some kind of magic prayer. God showed up because we messed up and we gave up. And when we looked up, he showed up. And every person that you talk to in this room has a story like that. And once upon a time, that was my story. Where I was at a place that I said, I can't fix this. I don't know how to make it better. And once upon a time, it might be your story or someone that you're sitting next to where they got to a place where they just said, I can't do this. I don't know what else to do. And they threw their hands up. They took their hands off the wheel. They took their hands off the controls that we try to control to manipulate the outcome of the situation. And then we just said, God, I give up. And God showed up in their circumstance. And that's what they would tell you. If you went to Rooted and they told their story, we hear it all the time. And they'd say this, that if it wasn't for the mess, I would have never met God. 
that God used the mess to arrange the meeting. That before they were a mess, before they were a mess, God was just kind of an idea, a thing you did on Sunday, you know, just kind of something that was out there. But as a result of getting to a point where this mess is so big that I just finally gave up and threw my hands up and God showed up. And God became more personal than he ever had before in their life. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna ask you to do something. I'm gonna ask you to do what Jesus asked Zacchaeus. What he asked that adulterous woman. What he asked the woman at the well. And it's, it's gonna be uncomfortable. People are probably gonna stare at you. But if you're here this morning and you've got a mess in your life and you don't know how you're gonna get out of it, and you didn't follow Jesus into it, but you're ready to show up and you're ready, you're ready to say, I give up and throw my hands up and look up. I'm gonna ask you to stand up and we're gonna, make, we're gonna do what Zacchaeus did and we're gonna do what that woman did, those women did, and we're gonna make a public declaration that God, I'm a mess. So if that's you, you've got a mess, I want you to stand up right now at your seat. People are gonna look at you. But it's the start of following Jesus out of that mess. Go ahead. Thank you. Now, one more group of people I'm going to ask you to stand. You don't currently have a mess in your life, but you know that you've got the controls. You're driving your life. And you know, Jesus said, that when the storms come, when, not if, when the rain comes, when the storms come, if your house is not built on the foundation of Jesus' teaching, because you know, I'm not really following Jesus. And I don't know what I would do. That's the second group I want you to stand, if that's you. And we're gonna pray. Father, we're a mess. I admit, God, that I've not built my house, my life, upon the teachings, that I've not followed you, that I have been in control, and in control has brought me to the place that I've been or will go or have been, and it's not good. And I'm tempted, Lord, to just want you to fix it, and you have before, and then I go right back into it. But today, God, I choose to follow you. I choose to follow you, Jesus. God, you sent your son, the light of the world, that I would follow him. So today I choose to follow you and I stand publicly and declare, I'm letting go of the controls of my life. (coughs) I'm letting go of the wheel and I'm going to follow you. And from this day forward, I will build my life upon your teachings and follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. Now I want everyone to stand. Because we're going to go into a song that we know. You've sung this song before. You're watching online. You might have sung this before. But there's, in the bridge of the song, there is a line that says, I will build my life upon you. And I changed the word because I, I want us to make a declaration when we get to that. It says, I will build my life upon your word it is a firm foundation and then it talks about and i will not be shaken because jesus said you will have tribulation you will have troubles in this world but he is very clear that if we will take his teachings and put them into practice and follow him that not only we will we not follow him into the mess but we will can follow him out of the mess so let's let's begin to sing Thank you. 